Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, the simple pleasure of a glass of Kool-Aid during childhood. What could possibly go wrong? Quite a bit. When you find an eyeball in your glass. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802. Or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. We would absolutely love to hear them. You can also write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. And if you really want to get involved with the show and be a person that helps keep the show on the air, we call them EPPs, kind of like EVP, but EPP, Extra Podcast People is what that stands for. You can sign up to be one at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash realghoststories. Uh, when I'm um, sorry, patreon.com slash ghost stories. Is it really yeah, patreon.com slash real ghost stories, right? I, my mind is so fluttered with crap right now uh, that it is hard to remember like anything because I'm juggling so many things. At I this. can finish the rest of the intro up for you. Okay. What is it? Patreon.com slash what? Real Ghost Stories Online. You get our ebook, our audiobook, and tons more. Yep. It's uh, patreon.com slash real ghost stories. So there you go. That's another place you can sign up to be an EPP. Why is my mind so flustered? Well, if you heard the show yesterday, you might have a better idea. Uh, We have one of ours uh, in our house in the hospital. It's not COVID, but it is a stomach flu that is absolutely horrible. We've all had it. Uh, She got hit the worst. Livy, Olivia is the one who's in there. Um, And so me and Harp are sailing the ship here at the house and Jen's in the hospital with her. And we're just trying to keep everything going. And uh, so, yeah, that upon running businesses, the holidays, uh, we have a farm and COVID. So I don't know what the hell else is going on around me because I don't think I could. (laughs) But we've been able to manage it. We have. And uh, the two of us are a pretty good team together managing it. Yeah. Like where I'm getting my schoolwork done, you're getting your work done. And at the end of the day... We usually go out and get some stuff at usually Harps or Walmart. If we need to, we try to avoid it, but yeah. Yeah, if we need to. Yeah, with the stomach stuff, it was like, what do you do to stop the, I, I don't say, like saying this word and I won't say it again, the diarrhea part of it. So I was doing some Googling and rice, toast, um, bananas, and applesauce. applesauce are the three biggest things. And we had some of that. We didn't have all of it. And I feel like we're kind of beyond the flu, but our like stomachs are still kind of trying to readjust back to normal. And that's taking a hell of a long time. Uh, I, we have nothing to complain about because Libby's in extreme pain and is very medicated up at the hospital and Jen's a uh, uh, wreck being very nervous about all that. And uh, so I, I can deal with the applesauce and having to run in and get that stuff. But my goodness, it's, uh, it's been a crazy week, but uh, the show must go on. Not to mention that the day that um, pretty much I got sick was on Friday the 13th the other day. So, hope you didn't have that bad a look. Haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to our first caller uh, here at Real Ghost Stories Online and share your real ghost story with us. Uh, let me pull it up here. Hang on one second. And we can hear it. And here we go. Hey guys, it's Steve here. Uh, got a little story. It's actually pretty interesting from the Appalachian mountains in the Southwestern part of Virginia, a lot of coal mining in that area. The, the whole economy has revolved around the lumber industry and coal mining and my grandparents uh, had a sizable track of land we call it the mountain and my grandfather mined coal and they had 13 children and all 
But uh, when my father was four years old, my grandfather was killed in uh, a mine-related incident. And uh, it was, you know, pretty shocking to the family. But the reason I'm calling in and giving you this story is it was a week after his death. He actually uh, would get, well, let me back up. He would get up every morning at 5 a.m. and hook to a, to a wagon. He'd hook a horse to the wagon, and he had a farm, you know, where they raised a lot of their food. So uh, he would hook to the wagon, and he would go out to the fields and out to the cattle, and he would feed, do whatever he would need to while the grandmother, my grandmother was getting breakfast ready for the children, and uh, he would come back and have breakfast with him. Then he would head off to work. Well, after he passed away, after he was killed, he actually was in a mining accident and burned alive. It was a week afterwards. The graveyard is only, you know, within sand distance from the house. And my grandmother, of course, up at 5 a.m., cooking breakfast for the kids and she hears this wagon go by the you know the old house and just as my grandfather would uh, come by through the mornings and you know to go out to the fields prior to going to work well she looked out the windows and and uh, you know she told this story several times my grandmother was not one of the tall tale kind of people you know it was if she told you something, it was it was the truth. It was gospel, you know. So uh, she said that she looked out all the windows, opened the door, looked out, didn't see nothing. And, you know, she thought, well, you know, her nerves, what she just went through, you know, uh, her nerves is, you know, playing tricks on her. So she goes about her day. The next morning, 5 a.m., she's up, starts breakfast, and sure enough, she hears that wagon and the horse and wagon come by the house again you know now this house was very secluded a mile from any other housing one mile from the regular bottom of the road to the top of this mountain where the they live very secluded up in the mountains she she hears it again she rushes to the windows doesn't see anything and she's thinking to herself by this time, my God, you know, am I going crazy? You know, what, what's up? So the next morning, she gets every one of the children up about a quarter till five in the morning, you know, and puts them by every window in the house. And sure enough, 5 a.m. comes around. All of them heard the horse and wagon come through. And they're looking out. They don't see nothing. They go to the door, open the door, hear it, but they don't see it. That was the last time they heard it, you know. And my apologies, I'm actually driving across country right now uh, for the background noise. But flash forward 20 years, she remarried. And again, I said earlier, this house, you know, the home place was very secluded up in the mountains. And the cemetery for the families on top of this mountain. And there's actually another cemetery on our family land that, you know, houses are, uh, is, has half fields on one side and the McCoys on the, on the other side of the cemetery. So my grandmother remarries, and of course, he's a coal miner as well. And you, it was hard to get a vehicle up this old wagon road to where the to the top of the mountain to where the home place was. So uh, my step grandfather at the time would walk off the mountain of the morning and catch a ride to the coal mines, and then they would drop him off at the foot of the mountain, and he would make the journey back to the top at night. And uh, there was a shortcut you could take uh, if you knew your way wasn't smart to take at night because it took you by a cliff face and it could be very dangerous but uh, if you knew the mountain and you knew the way you know it was a quicker way home for him well on this night uh, 
he's getting in late. This is my step grandfather. Uh, they work late. He gets in. It's a terrible storm has come through. It's real foggy that night, and he usually gets in around 8 p.m. every evening. Well, it's a little bit later that he gets off. Puts him about 8:30 getting in. It's real dark, foggy, and actually, I heard my father tell this story because he was at home at just visiting his mother just so happened to be this night and uh she tells him says you know what uh your your stepdad hasn't come in yet it's raining outside it's a storm uh, surely you know uh, he hasn't slipped on a rock and fell or he's injured and she's going to send my father down the mountain to see if he can you know spot him so my father gets to the front door and they open the door and you know, my, my step-grandfather, which would have been my dad's stepdad at that point, was standing at the front door, white as snow, just visibly shaken. They get him in the house and warm him up, and, you know, what's going on? And uh, he said, well, I got out of the, the truck, and I start to climb up the mountain, start walking, and I think, uh, you know, it's just miserable, the rain, so I'm going to take the shortcut. And I get lost, you know, it's so foggy, I can't see in the dark. Something cold as ice, he said, took him by the hand and led him, pulled him and led him to the front door of the house. And that's where my father and grandmother found him at the front door. And he was, he just couldn't talk, you know, for a few minutes. So he got his wits about him anyway. Uh, t today, you know, it's, uh, the land is still owned by the family, and there are several stories uh, associated that I may call back in if, if you would like and uh, tell you some of my personal experiences. One reason after my father has passed and my whole family is buried there, and uh, it gets pretty freaky. It's not a place I want to be uh, after dark, and I'm a grown man. <laughs> so love what you guys do. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us. We greatly appreciate it. That was a good one. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Let's go to this one. It says, I'm living in a green street in a tiny little town of 5,000 people way up in northern Canada. I was followed by a ghost for many years across numerous locations in different providences. I'll write in more of these experiences later. The first house is three stories tall, with the bottom floor converted to a rental suite that was occupied by the sweetest old lady you could ever meet. My sibling and I have all experienced many different paranormal activities at this location. My story started when I was about four or five years old. My mother had tucked me into bed and I had just started to doze off when I could hear what sounded like a train going through the house. Now, the house is three streets over from a railway track, but this noise was in the house. I sat up and the clatter stopped. I remember going to get a drink of water from my Kool-Aid man cup, the old plastic ones with the handle and had a Kool-Aid man in front of them. I found an eyeball surrounded by what I would now describe as mold staring up at me, like veiny and assortment of greens in color, as I was already used to. Such experiences, I just went to bed and when I woke the next day, the eye was gone and it appeared to be the same water from the previous pouring. To this day, I cannot drink out of the Kool-Aid cup or even bring myself to buy the juice for my own children. A few years later, when I was seven, my parents and I moved to a different city and rented the house to my brother. We'll call him Jim and his family. There's a 15 year age gap between us. Jim's job at the time was a long haul truck driver. So there were many times he wouldn't be home for days and not having to, a set time of frame uh, when he would arrive home. It could be any time during the day or night. At the end of the living room, it is where the TV was situated, and the stairs for the upper floor were to the right along the wall. Late in the night, while Jim's wife was sleeping, she heard the stereo turn on downstairs. Thinking it was Jim, she went down to meet him. No one was around, so she thought maybe it was a wiring issue and unplugged the unit, going back up to bed. She was just about to fall back asleep when it came again. She threw a glass down the stairs, heard a chatter against the wall, and the music stopped. She then barricaded herself in her daughter's room with her little girl, opened the window, and yelled for help. The neighbor next door called the cops, but when they arrived, there was no sign of an intruder or a forced entry. Thank you for so much for reading this. Love the story. Love the podcast. Keep up the amazing work. 
I have many more stories to share. I have almost a novel's worth. Well, that's actually very scary if you hear a train noise inside of your house. Like not even coming from outside. It almost makes me wonder if that ghost had died because, well, either he or she got hit by a train. Yeah, it makes you wonder what exactly happened uh, with that house. And then why a Kool-Aid cup? Why why show the eyeball in the Kool-Aid cup? A, a Kool-Aid cup of all things. Yeah, and scare the children. That's, yeah. Uh, 855-853-4802, our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. To share your Real Ghost Stories with us, we would love to hear them. Uh, let's go to another caller here on the program at 855-853-4802. Hi. Uh, yes, my name is Rufus Stevenson, and I live in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, out of Denver. And uh, I'm 82 years old and retired from the railroad after 43 years. And uh, my story began in 1969. And my older brother, who was 31 and I was 30, uh, but my older brother died back in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And my brother, who lived in Salt Lake City, which was younger than I, wanted to take his car that she had just bought a brand new 69 Plymouth Roadrunner and was going to make the trip from Salt Lake City to Denver, where I lived at, and then on to Vicksburg, Mississippi. The total amount of miles was about, uh, oh, probably close to 1,700 miles. And it was a happening along the way as we were making our way across Kansas into Kansas City, Missouri. And I had gone to sleep, and he was driving and they, our wives were in the back seat with one with my uh, niece, and they were sleeping. And after waking up from about a two-hour nap, uh, my brother was crying, and uh, I was trying to find out what was causing him to cry. And he wouldn't want to, didn't want to tell me right off the bat, but finally he did. Was telling me about our brother that had died in Vicksburg, and he had died at 31 and uh, had bled to death in a hospital in Vicksburg, Mississippi, had came and was sitting in the car and talked to him while I was asleep. And there's much more to the story. And like I say there, if you're interested in anything that I've got to tell, uh, you can get back in touch with me. Nope, we don't give out phone numbers on this show. And just assume when you call in, if you're sharing a story, we're interested in hearing all of it. Uh, I, I don't want just to snip it and then I'm going to call you back because that's not what we do. We don't call people back and uh, ask for more stories later. Either share it all now <laughs> or don't is uh, kind of how that works. But that, that does sound freaky. Yeah, that is really freaky if you're talking to a dead person in your sleep. Exactly. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Next uh, letter, it says, after watching some of the Las Vegas shooting incidents on YouTube, I settled down to my attic bedroom. A few minutes later, knocking began. There was no one else in the house at the time. I recorded the incident. There were previous paranormal events that happened in that house to the other members of my family. Also, the atmosphere and events that occurred there led us to believe something did not want to share the space with anyone. You can find the uh, video footage on YouTube. To this day, I can still hear them, but never have seen anything paranormal. I'll share that later. The latest occurrence was auditory. While getting ready for bed one evening, I was stopped in my tracks in the bathroom. I distinctly heard a male with a Hispanic accent say, Good night, girls. I love you. It's not scary. I'm the only male in the house. Initially, I figured it was my girlfriend telling her girls downstairs. When I opened the door to the bedroom, however, she had not moved an inch from where she was previously. I asked her if she got up, and after she said no... I shared what I heard in the bathroom behind a closed door. Her husband used to tell his daughters the same thing before retiring for the evening. He'd been dead for about three years. His oldest daughter sees him and feels him. Their interaction is disturbing her. Since she is only 16, I do not believe it is healthy for her. She does not want him to bother her anymore. His death is sudden and traumatic. While driving home from seeing a movie, he suffered a massive coronary event. We're about to move location soon, and it's my assumption that he knows... Just a thought. Throughout my childhood and adult life, there have been similar occurrences. No matter where I live, something happens out of the ordinary. It does not scare me anymore, but has had the opposite effect. It is a comfort to know 
that our energy is left behind, or at least the imprint of who we once were. Around 1999, while working as a private security guard at Valley River Center in Eugene, Oregon, I would do my rounds and respond to noise complaints as needed. This one shift at about 2 a.m., I walked into a hallway and immediately heard and observed a TV at almost full volume, but it was not on any station. The static and light coming from under the door drew my attention. At that time, I did not have a master key to enter the room. Instead of announcing myself, I proceeded to the front desk and requested the key card. I informed the night auditor of what was going on and went back up to the room. Upon reaching the door of room 303, I did not hear anything else going on in the room. It was not only quiet, but eerily quiet, as if something were standing behind the door staring at me. Never have I been so apprehensive in carrying out my duties. This time proved different because I felt the need to get as far away from that door as soon as possible. I hurried back to the front desk, not sure of what happened or even what to do next. After handing the key card back to the night auditor, I asked her to look up who was in that room. She said that hallway was almost empty of guests. Room 303 and the adjacent 305 were unoccupied. The first thought that went through my head was a squatter broke into the room. That thought quickly fled when she then asked me, don't you know what happened up there? Obviously, since I did not, she told me a brief rundown. I avoided the hallway altogether for about a week after researching the tragic story of Catherine and Martini Lissy. I wondered why room 303 and not 305 gave me problems that morning. And I figured the hotel changed room numbers around or time after the murder. So people would not be making weird requests to stay in that room as a tourist attraction. I do not know. And I cannot explain it. Okay. Something about static. It's just really, really creepy. Would you ever stay in a hotel room that you knew was the site at one point in time of a tragic murder? No. Just no, not no way, no whatsoever. No, 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 no. Well, hell no. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's pretty, uh, uh, you got your point across there. There's no way that that would ever be something that you would do. I, uh, I don't think I could do it either. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it, it's something I, I, I don't think I'd ever want to do. Me neither. The energy, and I'm not super duper sensitive or anything like that, but I think even just, just the psychological effect of it on this end, just knowing that something like that had happened would just be really too much to deal with. You know, yeah. For, like, I want to be able to sleep. No, no. Uh, 855-853-4802. Let's go to another caller. Hi. Hey, guys. Uh, this is Will from Tampa, Florida. Um I want to tell you guys a story about something that took place when I was living in Pennsylvania. Um, I visited a historic landmark located in Brownsville, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, known as the Nemecolin Castle or Bowman's Castle. Uh, this place was actually featured on a number of uh, you know shows that do the paranormal investigating and whatnot. Uh, but anyhow, I lived there for quite some time, and I was always interested in visiting this place. So uh, my mother actually shares a similar interest in, uh, you know, paranormal uh, investigations and pretty much anywhere that has a history. So we agreed that we were going to go ahead and check this place out. Uh, we went there, you know, nothing crazy, you know, no wild experiences. You know, you definitely can sense the energy, but really nothing happened while we were there uh, on site. So, you know, we left and I went home and my mother went to her house and, uh, I was actually laying in bed, getting ready to go to bed, talking to my wife, and it cut the TV off, and I started to hear what sounded like two men having a conversation, pretty much like right outside of my bedroom window. And that kind of, you know, raised some concern because where we lived at really wasn't that much of a populated area. I was pretty rural, so it was like, hmm, you know, like, you know, I kind of ignored it at first, and it began to get louder and louder and like an argument going on between two men and i became a bit frustrated with this so i was like you know what i'm gonna get up and see what the heck's going on and i hear the last thing i remember hearing was someone say what are you doing here you don't belong here you know a man to another man and i open the door and it's complete silence and i knew at that moment i'm like what i heard was not what i thought i heard there's no way because there's no way anyone could get away that quickly no one would have known that i was about to open the door at that time no one would have had the opportunity to get away that quickly. It's a long 
long street both ways. There's just no way. So, you know, once that kind of happened, I was a little freaked out, of course, but I just kind of shrugged it off. I didn't even say anything to my wife. Got back in bed and uh, went to sleep. And I, you know, had a terrible nightmare. This nightmare was basically something was trying to harm my wife. And in the dream, I'm fighting this entity off, this demon. And I'm like telling him, you know, you can't have my wife, leave my wife alone. And I come out of that sleep and I'm like, I'm paralyzed. I can, I can look around the room, but I can't say anything. I can't move. And I can hear my wife kind of like whimpering or like crying. And I realized that, you know, she's still sleeping and she's having a nightmare as well. And like, you know, what is going on here? And, you know, I finally was able to break free of my paralysis and I'm waking her up and I'm saying, Hey, you know, everything is okay. Like, I'm trying, I'm like kissing her on her forehead. I didn't want to like shake her awake, you know, try to wake her up calmly. And she came out of it and she said, you know, I was having a nightmare and someone was trying to harm me and you were trying to fight them off. And I'm like that, that right there was a little crazy. Cause you know, we're having the same similar nightmare. But the other thing was that she said she experienced the paralysis as well. She was trying to yell for me. She was trying to look around. She couldn't do anything but just lay there until, you know, I brought her out of it. Uh, anyway, we look at the clock. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, we're like, oh, man, perfect. 3 o'clock in the morning. We've got stuff going on. But somehow we managed to get back to sleep. And the next morning we go down to the table and we're, we're sharing breakfast with our two children. Uh, and out of nowhere... Our oldest is just like, hey, mom, you know, when did you leave the bedroom last night? And we're like, look at each other, like, what the heck is this dude talking about? And he's like, uh, no, I mean, you came in, you laid down in bed with me. I woke up out of my sleep. I saw you there. I saw your hair, like, in the back of your head. And I, uh, you know, I kind of, like, rubbed my fingers through your hair and I fell back asleep. Uh, and when I woke up, you were no longer in there. And he's like, and I remember because it was 3 o'clock in the morning. And that right there freaked us out because we knew that there was no way we were not in there that either of us were in his bedroom and it was the same exact time that we both you know we experienced the night terror so whatever this was whether it had been good bad something you know took on the form of my wife to my son and after that it was just instance after instance you know like my wife being scared or doors being slammed or things like that in, the, in my entire house Windows open, like blinds open, light would not go in my home. My home was dark for days and days and days. And I got to the point where I was so frustrated with this, I just started to scream at the top of my lungs, like, you know, you're no longer welcome here. You know, whoever you are, you know, you know, we're not going to put up with, the, with being terrorized in our home. You know, I'm screaming at this entity. And, you know, it seemed like I, I can't remember exactly what it was. I began to pray. And I just remember feeling this weight lifted off of my shoulders and my home actually like light started to pour into my home again it was completely insane but in conclusion i can say that there's something from that place that i visited that attached itself to to me and began to give my family a hard time and i just thought it was the craziest experience um you know something that i really can't explain to this day but it's just one of the many experiences that I've had uh, living in that area, and I thought that it was worth sharing with you guys. Keep up the good work. Love the show, and I will continue to listen on. Thank, Thank you guys. for uh, for sharing that with us. That would be terrifying, and that's a prime example of sleep paralysis in a situation where it's obviously more than just sleep paralysis because the two people are experiencing the same dream at the same time. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Without there being some sort of outside influence. I'm not saying this didn't happen to him or I'm doubting it. Not at all. I'm just saying that is not a normal thing without something else going on. Yeah. Like, especially at the same time, they both woke up. Yeah. Same paralysis, trying to wake the other person up, but they're just still and they can't do anything. Is it a warning of something to come? Is it a, or is it just something that's there to simply try and terrify them? Because that's what it likes to do. And that's the mystery that needs to be solved. On the next Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> do, 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 sorry, do, we, do, do. sorry, last night we would just watch the old Unsolved Mysteries. We did. That's how we go to sleep now. <laughs> 
<laughs> Late night when it's just uh, Harper and me, we sit on the couch and we watch Unsolved Mysteries and Robert Stack freak us out. It's great times. And we eat watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that gets into the mix. All right, that's going to wrap up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, keep us on the air. Become an extra podcast person. EPP at ghostpodcast.com. Sign up there or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Five bucks a month gets you into the uh, uh, EPP club, if you will, and you get all the access to the bonus episodes, new ones every single week, archived episodes, advanced episodes, and more. It helps keep us on the air. Until next, until next time, for Harper and all of us at Real Ghost Stories Online, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening.